You're watching Tim Topham TV, the piano teaching podcast. This is episode number 58. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Great to uh, have you with me today. Uh, and we've got a great episode, something a little bit different today, actually. We've called this one How Passion, Mindset, and a Sharpened Saw Can Transform Your Teaching with Tim and Paul. And this is actually a little bit more of a conversation between Paul Myatt and myself um, in regard to two things mindset and also professional development. Uh, and this is obviously timely. Uh, because we're running some live events around Australia coming up uh, in the very near future. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about the background of why we're doing it, why we think it's important, and the kinds of things that you're going to get out of it. Now, before we dive right into today's episode, I did want to thank today's sponsor, which is Novascore.com. Novascore, as I've said in my previous couple of intros, is my place for grabbing different adaptations of the same piece of music. So music that's produced at different kind of levels for different levels of challenge for students. So quite often the problem I find is regardless of the type of music, it could be classical, it could be a new hit, it could be gospel, whatever it is, you go online to try and find something maybe on Music Notes uh, or Sheet Music Plus and the music's just too difficult. Uh, The great thing about Novascore is that not only do they have that original score there, they've also then got two or three, sometimes four adaptations at a simpler level for students to learn from. And the great thing is that these are created by in-house pianists. They've got the right fingerings, they've got the right phrasings, they're playable and they sound great. And so even if the music's too hard, jump on there and just check if it's in their catalogue because you may find an easier version ready to go. You can view their music from any device, computer, laptop, tablet, smartphone, and you can print from any laptop or computer as well. So to get 30% off, your first order from Novascore, just head to the show notes for today's episode and you can grab the coupon. And those show notes are at timtopham.com slash episode 58. So our conversation today is all about passion and mindset. And we'll tell you what the sharp and saw means a little bit later on. It's a little bit of a quote and a reference back to a great author called Stephen Kobe and his Seven Habits for Highly Effective People, a book from uh, quite a while ago, but still has 100% relevance today. So we're talking about mindset and the mindset of uh, the innovative teacher, the creative teacher, and the teacher who is passionate about being the best that they can be, what that actually means and what kind of ways there are available for you to develop habits that actually last because half the time, well, I don't know about you, when I go to conferences, I get you know so many great ideas, lots of fantastic things happening, great people, great ideas. I've got notes full of books, oh, sorry, books full of notes, but you get back, you might try something out, but it just doesn't stick because it hasn't formed a habit. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about habits and the importance of those, particularly after live events. And then we're going to go into a little bit more about both Paul's story and my story and also why we've put on these events. So around Australia coming up in September, October and November, we've got some live events called Transform Your Teaching. And they are one day events from about 10 till 3.30. And we're going to be covering a whole lot of different stuff, including improvisation, harmonization, Uh, pattern-based teaching, some ideas based around the music learning theory concepts that we've been talking about in the last couple of months, singing, oral stuff. It's going to be practical. And the best thing is all the participants get to sit at a digital piano. So not only will you be able to hear and write down notes about what we're talking about, you can actually try them. And this is one of the best ways to start forming those habits because you can actually experience the ideas that we've got. So we'll go on and tell you a little bit about what's coming up in these events. If you're not in Australia, I guarantee you're still going to enjoy this interview because we're talking about bigger mindset kind of ideas that can particularly be challenging when, uh, as I know, the USA have just gone back to teaching in the fall season. And, you know, your mind can just be blown with everything that's going on and scheduling and all this kind of stuff. So it takes sometimes it's a good idea to take some time out to listen to a conversation like this and just reset yourself. Now, if you're interested in finding out more about the events and you're based around Australia, we're traveling to Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, Perth, and Brisbane. To find out more and grab a ticket, timtopham.com slash transform. 
All right, and today's episode's show notes and your coupon code for NovaScore will be at timtopham.com slash episode 58. So here's the conversation between Paul and me about mindset, passion, and a sharpened saw. Well, Paul, welcome back onto the podcast. I think you're my second only ever repeat guest. So it's great to have you here. Thank you, Tim. I'm, I'm afraid you're not. You know, I'm afraid you're not the first repeat guest, but the second is just as just as important. And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, and today, look, today for everyone that's listening and watching, um, it's going to be a little bit of a different podcast. We're going to be. I, I'm not going to be asking all the questions today. It's going to be very much a conversation between Paul and I, and we're talking about something that we both think is really, really important, and that's mindset in particular. And how that leads to our take on professional development and leading then on to some of the live events that we're actually running around Australia uh, in September, October and November this year. So I think we will see where the discussion actually goes, but I wanted to talk mindset first up, Paul. Um, and in, you know, in education circles, we hear a lot about this, you know, cre- creativity mindset. We're trying to encourage growth mindsets in our students. You know, what, what's all of this about and why as teachers should we be thinking about this as well? Well, Tim, I think that we have, a, as teachers, it's really important for us to work with our students to guide them into what it is that they actually want. You know, what is it you'd like to achieve with your music? And I see many times, myself included, I impose, oh, well, we're going to do that grade three exam mm. <laughs> or we're going to, you know, and sometimes you think, hmm, is that really what they want? And yeah. it's really trying to establish what their mindset is around. You know, do they want? Why do they want to learn music? And what's it going to give it give to them? And I think it's really about making a discussion, having a discussion with your students, and of course their parents about what is it that you'd like to achieve with your music. Um, one of the things I sort of say to parents, you know, I would never wish that you would become a professional musician unless you really, really wanted to, you know, but the scientific evidence about learning music is just astronomical. And as you know, from your interview with Anita Collins, Mm. that it's just so much benefit from learning music and the uh, students um, can really benefit from just doing that. Yeah, I, I tend to ask all my questions, uh, all my students. I don't know if you do the same thing. I tend to ask them all, particularly the teenagers. You know, why are you learning piano? What is it that's brought you here, and what would you like to be able to do in three years, five years, even by the end of this year? Particularly if they're just starting and they're thirteen or fourteen. You know, what is it that's brought you here? Because I think it is vital for us to know that to work out actually what our approach to teaching them should be. Do you tend to take that same line? I don't teach a lot of teenagers, so my I teach a lot of um, primary age students because of I only take students when they're five or six. Yeah. So that it's very adult directed at that stage or parent directed. Yeah. But by the time they're eleven or twelve, they're really making their own decisions, mm. and it's really about having a discussion with them. And I find that those kids. To move them through onto uh, higher levels is really about having that discussion about what is it that you'd like to learn mm. and, and building. I think you know, the way I teach, because I teach in classes, that they're, they've built a community in music. So it's really about, oh, I love coming to music because it's fun and my friends are here. Mm. So it's a little bit different, I suppose, than one-on-one teaching, which I'm, which is what you're, you know, you specialise in. Yeah, yeah. And, and I remember interviewing Laura Kahar about uh, piano community. She, it was how to create a community around her piano studio. And yeah, she has, she has great, there's some fantastic outcomes that come from that. So, so students aren't just there to, because they know they've got to do their next exam or perform at the end of the year, but they're there because they can chill out with their friends, they can have a laugh, they can have some fun, they can learn some music. It's a, well, it's, it's they a can different make music. thing. Yeah, and they can make music together. Yeah. And as a pianist, we often never play with anyone. And if you were to be a professional pianist, one of the jobs that you would be is a company. Mm. And 
Very, and as you have just done, I know this last week, <laughs> oh, the, AFB, <laughs> the champion accompanist. <laughs> um, and, you know, those, as a, as a piano teacher, you know, another way to generate income is through accompanying. And so doing a lot of that sort of work, um, uh, and but in a, in, in a situation, in, in a learning situation where they can actually play together, they learn to listen mm. and they learn to be able to accompany and hear what the other person is doing, which is a really important skill as an accompanist. So if we think, if we kind of turn this around now from the, the student mindset to the teachers, uh, I have a feeling that a lot of the teachers that watch and listen to these podcasts have a mindset of wanting to continually improve themselves. That's why they're listening anyway. So in mm. some ways we might be preaching to the converted a little bit, but let's dive a little bit into the mindset of teaching. And what, what's your thought on that? Oh, professional development really is my first thing. Um, I spend a great deal of time. You know, just this year I've done two um, big workshops um, on professional development and I think that we have to, and, and it's a it's a Stephen Covey cliche yeah. called, uh, you know, sharpen the saw, and it's about making yourself better so that you can actually impart the knowledge better. So I think from a teaching perspective, the, one of the first things you can do is actually improve yourself and put yourself in a learning situation. Yeah. Because as a teacher, we sometimes forget what it's like to actually be a learner. Mm. And um, in my other lo- my hobby job, I'm a swimming coach. And I always say to the people when I coach swimming, um, you know what my real job is? I'm a piano teacher. And they go, oh, wow. <laughs> and they go, how does piano and, I, and, mu- and swimming go together? And I said, well, actually, they're really similar to teach because we don't do either of them naturally. We don't naturally swim. We don't naturally play the piano. And they're both very technique-based activities. Mm. So the process that you're going to use to teach is going to be very similar. Yeah. I wrote recently about my experience of learning learning guitar. And I think in that article, I, I, I talked about how maybe five years ago, I had to learn how to teach trumpet and trombone because I was asked to teach it in a year seven band class at one of my schools. And I'd, I'd never taught either of these instruments before. And, you know, when I was asked to do it, I thought, oh, no, it's the last thing I want to do is learn, it, learn how to play trumpet and trombone. But I got into it and the experience was absolutely fascinating because I was a complete and utter novice. I had to go and get lessons from the teacher who knew how to play it and I had to struggle through the basics of making a sound, finding a note, getting the embouchure right. Uh, it was a great experience. And and I, when I think about my own mindset and the way I approach things, I have to say that I've learned so much from being in the learner's shoes. And, mm-hmm. and also with my um, diploma that I did, uh, my performance diploma maybe five, four or five years ago, it's exactly the same thing. You're sitting there as a piano student, you suddenly realise it's exactly what it's like. You you know, you go in there, you've done all your work and everything falls apart and <laughs> it's just fascinating, I think. Exactly. Well, I know all about falling apart. I, I, was, I started learning classical singing um, about three years ago and did my grade eight, got an A for my grade eight, thought, oh, right, I'll just go straight to Amos <laughs> and then massive fail. <laughs> right. So we should actually, um, we should tell everyone uh, if they're overseas, what's Amos? What's it's uh, a, a diploma in um, in the performance of, okay, yeah. of a particular instrument or obviously I'm, I was doing classical voice. And this is run by the AMEB, A- who's the Australian Music Australia. Exam Board. So what happened? Um, wasn't ready, really. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm busy and I thought I could get away with not doing as much practice as I really needed to. But I, I suppose the uh, exam was about a month too early and um, I was Playing, singing, sorry, singing a, a Bernstein piece that was my accompanist and I actually got from the start to the end on the Wednesday before the exam for the first time. Oh, God. <laughs> it was never going to end well. Oh, no. <laughs> but it was a great learning experience. It was, you know, it's re- it was really about getting back on the horse and going again and going, well, I learned something from that. I learned actually I do need to do a little bit more work and I'm not really as clever as I think as I thought I was. And that's a really good one for kids as well because 
I know I've had kids that get A's for grade eight, uh, for grade one, and then they get a C for grade two or grade three. And it's like they had to learn that they actually had to put the work in, whereas before they were talented. So it was, it was, it, it's a really good thing for us to learn as well. And it certainly was great for me to experience that. But I'm back on the horse. I'm going to do it again next year. Um, and, I, I mean, I do it for ho- as my hobby. Um, I sing with the symphony chorus um, in Sydney, so I get to sing beautiful music, but it's just about, about fun. But it's really, again, putting yourself into that learning um, experience. I don't know how you do it all, coaching, swimming. Do you coach running as well? I do. So you do that. You run a large music school, a set of music schools. <laughs> you teach yourself. You do some singing on the side. You sing in the Sydney Philharmonia Chorus. Uh, let's talk for a moment about how you actually find the time to put into these professional development activities. Well, it's all about working on your own timetable, I suppose, and which is what I do with my kids. You know, like my kids come and go, oh, I didn't have time to practice this week. I was so busy. Mm. <laughs> this is from an eight-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think that, you know, I uh, one of the best things I think as teachers that we can do for our students is actually um, – create a timetable a weekly timetable in fact i've got some notes we can put up on the show notes with a timetable that people can use as the piano teacher we're often the recipient of so much so much knowledge some of it that we don't necessarily want to know um you know kids tell us all any number of things Mm. um as do parents sometimes um but we can help um, you know, and help managing time is a really important thing because a lot of people aren't good at managing time, especially kids. And so that's we do expect I, a lot from them, don't we? Uh, we do, yeah, I think. Yeah. So, from my own experience, I have to manage my time really, really well. Um, I think, and as I know you are um, interested in, because you're a, also a qualified PE teacher, um, really interested in sport and fitness, mm. as I am. And I think that allows us to be able to do all the things that we do because we have the level of energy and um, the health mm. to be able to do that. And that's an important thing as well. Yeah, I think uh, health, yeah, health is very important. I was listening to a podcast about that uh, for entre- an entrepreneur's podcast uh, and uh, the importance of keeping healthy and how, mm. how that's uh, starting to go virtual now. I don't know if you've heard of the, the latest trend in PTs is virtual PTs where you get texts from people every day saying, okay, this is your workout for today. And at the end of the day, they say, right, what did you eat? You tell me this this kind of thing. And they train people all around the world. It's very interesting. Right. Very interesting. I think I'd be, actually, I think I'd be really good at that. I respond very well to texts. <laughs> now, I should clarify, I, I'm not a fully qualified PE teacher. I have taught it before. Um, oh, really? Yeah, uh, but no, my my training is is definitely in the in the in the music base. But I, as you've mentioned, I have taught a huge variety of different subjects. So I have taught outdoor education and PE and IT, um, and I have a feeling that that has been part of the reason why I approach things like I do. I I haven't had that standard training through a conservatory model that kind of puts you into one path necessarily. I've kind of gone, gone around, I've taught in many different areas overseas, different states of Australia doing different things, large schools, heads of head of campus. I was for a while. And I think that now that I've come back to the music, I have this approach that says, you know, why why do we do things like we do things? That's mm-hmm. that's kind of what what my mindset's all about. Mm-hmm. And and I remember when I first started really getting into the piano teaching, I reconnected with my old teacher, uh, and who I remember her distinctly saying um, that you know you're likely because of the way you approach things, you're likely to ruffle some feathers in a fairly traditional industry. Uh, and I've always been reasonably proud of of my approach to doing that because I think by asking questions and finding out whether we are doing things the right way and asking can we do it better or should we do it differently or why don't we just give it a try anyway, we have this 
potential for huge growth. Mm, exactly, exactly. Well, as um, uh, the, one of the quotes that uh, we were talking about, um, you know, from Albert Einstein, once you stop learning, you start dying. I know, oh, it's, it's a bit morbid, but it's, you know, I think it's yeah, I, on. I, I, I agree. I, I mean, my dad's in hospital at the moment and um, <clears throat> I'm trying to, he did the the uh, tests for um, you know how his brain is operating, and he like he got ninety eight percent or something. And I'm thinking, Dad, you can learn how to use the internet, and I'm, like, I'm trying <laughs> to get him to use the internet and stuff like that. So, uh, and because I think it's really important, he needs to look, start learning because it really gets your brain going and stuff. Mm. Go talking. On. Oh, I was just going to say, talking about the whole brain stuff, um, you know, you mentioned that I coach running and swimming and I actually coach running and swimming for a charity uh, which is called Can2 mm. and they raise money for cancer research and um, so participants go and do an event and then they have to raise money to, um, to, for that during the time that they are training. And it, they have raised over $10 million dollars uh, sorry, yeah, over $10 million in Australia in the last 10 years. It's quite amazing. And they fund cancer researchers. So in Australia, it's something like only 10% of research grants are actually ever granted, 10% of all the, the grants. Right. And so they fund these researchers to do research into cancer. And um, they, uh, can't, they bring their, these researchers around to meet the participants. And I always sort of say, so did you learn music when you were a kid? And they go, oh, yeah. Yeah, I played the trumpet or whatever or piano or something. And every single one of them that I've spoken to has learned music. <laughs> and I, my, my thing is I don't want to teach the next Beethoven or Mozart. I want to teach the next Nobel laureate to find <laughs> a cure for cancer. And so that's my big um, thing about why I do coaching the, coach the running and swimming because it's – at the end of the day, it's helping these kids who are incredibly talented and often made talented because of, of us little piano teachers along the way, mm. you know, building creativity with them that has allowed their brain to open up and be creative and they've done their PhD in science or whatever and it gives them an opportunity to get work and then find cures and stuff. And they've, they've actually had two major um, cures created in the last 10 years, which is just amazing. Mm. So what would you say to uh, music teachers who might be umming and ahhing about the events that we're running? We've got a one-day events we're going to talk about in a moment, which is all related to this the concept we're talking about. What would you say to them if they're a bit on the fence? You know, they've got a full studio, parents seem happy, kids are playing piano. Uh, why should teachers in that situation still consider an event like the one we're running. Can I go back to the Albert Einstein quote? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think... I mean, it's pretty it's easy, a, though, to get in your, in, into a comfortable groove and just keep yeah, doing the same things, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It really is. I think that a lot of people, um, when you get into that groove, things start to decay uh, along the way, and you might notice that you'll have one or two students that drop off and... And you think, oh, maybe I should do something, you know. And so I, I suppose have a look at your studio, you know, have a look at what you're doing in your life and and is it matching your the mindset that you want to set out to achieve? And then go, maybe I could learn something. And I always go to workshops with the the sort of thought of if I can learn one new thing, it's been worthwhile. Mm. And some of the things that we're doing um, is you know, talking about getting uh, improvising, teaching improvising, which a lot of people are absolutely terrified about. Mm. Um, and, and so are kids often as well. So some really easy strategies to, for doing that. Some fun things to do with technical work. Mm -hmm. Getting kids to read. Is that a bloody nightmare or what? <laughs> <laughs> Um, especially when you teach using, well, we, we use a, a sort of music learning theory approach. So listen, sing, play, re oh, read. Oh, I, I knew I had to get to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, just, I was actually just talking about that whole concept with, um, with 
Susan, when I recorded her podcast, we were talking about the special needs teaching and the importance, again, this the music learning theory concepts keep coming up. Mm. Uh, and it works it works in that uh, area as well with special needs students in particular the the reading is is a lot I don't sometimes you wouldn't even get to it but singing listening that's what it's about at the start it's got to be absolutely experience and then, and then that whole thing about um, you know all the you know, for example in Australia all of the theory exams have gone online and we're doing so much stuff online and just you know, even think, talking about the importance of using a pencil and why it's important and sharing ideas on how to, you know, what what have you done, what have you used? And I think the ability for, for teachers to actually sit down at a piano with somebody else and share ideas mm. has to be one that is just so valuable. Mm. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because that's one of the key uh, differences in the events that we're running. Um, we're going to be giving everyone a digital piano to work at. Uh, That's right. And, and I think that is, that is so crucial. One of my um, big kind of things that I think about is habit, habit forming. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, what tends to happen at many of these events that I go to and that others go to is you just you come back with so many great ideas and you've written them all down and you've got notebooks full of great things. But a week later, a month later, two months later, the problem is that we tend to slip back into the old routines. And unless we actually make a conscious decision to try something and try it a number of times, mm. it doesn't tend to stick. Do you find the same? Well, you know, it, Take the sport analogy. It takes eight to twelve weeks to make something autonomic, which means that you, you mean uh, automatic, or do you mean autonomic? No, autonomic. Okay. As autonomic. So it's integrated into the body. Right. So um, as opposed to you know, we automatically think about it, but yeah, but it, you know, so it's the same thing. You know, it takes that long to build that habit into your teaching. You know, and you've got to. I'm sure everyone knows with their own student. You know when they learn a mistake in something, mm. to unlearn that is a great challenge. Mm. And so it's the same thing, really. You know, it's it's building your experience uh, and creating a habit through doing it once, doing it again, and then thinking at the end of the week, oh, I did it three times, and evaluating. Mm. Uh, and what? How did it? How did it work for me? So I suppose it's got to be, be a little bit of a process. Mm. And I think that's going to be one of the great benefits of having a keyboard to actually work at, is that when we try something out, instead of just writing down the idea and going, "Wow, that's a great idea, Paul," we can actually go, "Okay, let's. We're going to try it out right now," so that we've got that experiential side of learning, which you don't get in a lecture format. And I think that's exactly. going to be crucial to starting that process of habit forming. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially in improvisation where we're going to start very, very simply and just building on on one note, mm. two notes, then add three notes, and then, okay, take that away. And also strategies for improvising when you've got older children who are readers because mm. readers are terrified of improvisation. Mm. So I've got some really good strategies and uh, actually I'll give you a little video I put up of um, one of my kids after two weeks. He's a very good improviser and at any chance he will do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm pretty lucky there. But it's still, I use the same process with him um, and it's it's about getting um, kids to go through that process and then they can start to, oh, if you do this, I could do this. Mm. Or how about trying this? Mm. Well, and you've been sharing some of those, uh, some of your improvisation workbook ideas in the inner circle in our forums. It's been great to to try these out. Uh, and I, I've used them with my students. It's great. Just a one page, here's a page. And basically you've got a really simple left-hand pattern and you've got here are the notes you can improvise with Make, make your own piece out of it. And for readers, I think this is uh, such an approachable way to approach improvisation. 
Yeah, and it's easy. I'm, I'm, I'm not inventing the wheel. This is all. This has all come from my off background, mm. um, doing and doing workshops with, you know, Richard Gill and and the likes of and that sort of quality educator. You get so many amazing ideas. So they're not my ideas. I'm just, I'm just sort of um, using them um, in piano. That what I suppose is unique is that. Orf is often used in schools and in big groups and, and using for recorder or for xylophones and things. But the same things you can do on piano as, um, was it Rashti? Right, uh, Vashti. Vashti, sorry. Yes. yes. And, I mean, she was great. You know, your podcast with uh, Vashti was sensational about the, some of the things that you can do. Yep, that's episode 45, which was about using Orf. O R F F. If you haven't heard about it, to teach uh, piano and, and rhythm, it was it was a great episode. She took us hot through the studio. She had students there; they were playing instruments. It was crazy. <laughs> it was great fun. Um, we'll be doing a little bit of that um, playing instruments. I have a um, I have sets of chimes, chime bars. So we'll be doing some of that with um, the people um, and that come to the workshops. So they'll actually get the experience. And I find that children who do the chimes first, it takes away the pressure of the piano. So mm, yeah, you, that's what Vashti said. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so quick overview of what we're going to do. The event goes from about 10 till 3.30-ish. Um, we're going to start with a bit of a warm-up, something pretty practical um, and kind of setting the scene for the day. We've got, uh, and that's about 10 o'clock, I think maybe 11 o'clock in Perth. I think we've got a slightly different time frame, but... Um, about 10 o'clock, so you don't have to get up too early uh, on the morning of these uh, workshops. We've then got uh, two sessions, one before and then one after morning tea when uh, part of the group will go with you and we're going to be doing the improvisation work. So you've kind of talked about that, I guess, today um, so far and the other half will be with me and we'll talk about what I'm going to do in a second and then we swap over after morning tea um, and we've got lunchtime as well. And then after the lunch, we're going to talk about um, some of the music learning theory concepts that you've based a lot of your work and your teaching on. Um, patterns, rhythms, some of the off ideas, the way you use singing as well. Do you want to talk just a little bit more about what teachers might expect in that session? I mean, we've well, got, I know we could cover lots here. Here we will have to know. Well, it's really about... Um, probably for a lot of it is actually getting away from the piano and mm. um, I find that once you get kids away from the piano and doing rhythms and singing and patterns um, then when they get to the piano it's it's already in their body mm. so there's a lot of stuff that we'll be doing around that yeah um, so lo- lots of singing and and using percussion instruments because I can tell you your kids, the, your, your kids will love using percussion instruments. I am like, we, I do, um, you know, Royal March of the Lion, um, which is uh, the... Saisons? Uh, yes. That, yeah, Carnival it, of the Animals. Yeah, we, mm-hmm. I did the arrangement, or Gillian and I did the arrangement of, I think, the one that's in the preliminary book from the Piano for Leisure. <laughs> um, but just getting kids um, to... Do the drums, you know. Mm. Lion march, lion march, lion march, and just that of getting that and playing along with it, it just that the rhythm is in their body. Because mm. what you'll get a lot is. Or something like that, they'll start playing the rhythms. Both hands in, together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, God, I have, uh, just had a really good question. Can't remember. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Don't you hate that? Well, so tell me, um, tell me, what are you doing in yours? Tim was teaching toolkits. Yeah, so look, I was I was going to focus on one aspect of teaching and maybe maybe focusing on teaching teen beginners because uh, I know that's something that I know a lot about and is can be quite difficult. But what I actually thought I'd do, uh, this, is, this is what my – my schedule from from this year's presenting looked like um and so I, i've given i don't know a, a number of speeches and keynotes and things uh around uh australia in particular this year so i thought i'm actually just going to take some key things from each of those talks that i've given and the things that i do in my studio 
and package it into one really practical session. And so I'm going to talk about three main areas. One's going to be teaching strategies. Secondly, technology and technique, funnily enough. And people haven't heard me talk about technique all that much uh, because I guess I focus more on the creative things. But what I'm going to be doing is talking about how I use, and I think you might cover this too, how you can make scales an actual practical thing that students can use by mm. incorporating improvisation and backing tracks and things like that with it. Because oh, I, yeah, I, I would challenge most teachers to ask their students in their next lesson, why are you learning scales? Or why do I put so much uh, focus on you learning scales as a teacher to the student and see what they say? And even my students, until I've gone through this with them a number of times and shown them that melodies are all come will come from scales. Scales form the basis, the root notes of chord progressions. Uh, it, it it is so fundamental, but we often don't make that connection between a technical exercise and its practical use. Sure, it helps get the fingers moving. It learns patterns which come up in music. That's true, but there's so much more to it. So, talking about things like that to do with technique in technology. Uh, everyone knows that uh, I'm a big user of technology, but I also know that there is so much out there and it can be overwhelming. So we'll just be covering maybe two or three crucial apps that I use all the time and why and really try to help teachers form a habit with those apps if they choose to um, because that's the other problematic thing when it comes to technology. There is so many options I find, and I, and I know uh, in, in the uh, Inner Circle forums, people come up with a, a new app that they really love, uh, Ningenius, we, we talked about a little while ago, and I used that for a while, and but I didn't have the habit. So I've, yes. kind of, I've kind of stopped using it now, but there's no reason why. It's, it's still a great app. I just didn't quite form that habit. I, I, did you keep, keep using that in the end? Uh, my kids remind me all the time. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> it's time for Ningenius because <laughs> I've got little... Um, I put them up in the inner circle. I made a little um, Ningenius uh, score sheet. Yep. So you get, um, so for those people who don't know what Ningenius is, it's a really uh, great app for getting kids to learn to read music. So, and you can use what I always do because of how I teach, I want them to read the music and play the note. So mm. they have to actually play play the note on the keyboard. Mm. Or you it will it will you can choose the A, B, C, D, or E or whatever. Um, but there's music playing and it's like adrenaline to get to the game and it's about getting the highest score. Yeah. And of course because I teach kids in class, the competition is unbelievable. Oh, it'd be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> and they're like I wish I had multiple iPads. Um, like I wish I had that I could actually just hand out eight iPads at a time. Right? Unfortunately, I don't have eight iPads to do that. Mm. But there is so much competition, and then and it's like the prize. So I do a lot of things where, um, right? Well, oh, um, you know, Johnny was sitting there playing with beautifully curled fingers. Come and have a game of Ninja. So everyone will come around, and then. And then you'll see everyone's got beautifully curled fingers. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> they want to be next. <laughs> it's good. So it's all about, you know, reinforcing the teaching technique or the technique that you want to achieve. Mm. Um, and so, yeah. I always, it's great- I, yeah, I, I always try and remind teachers in workshops that technology is simply a toolbox or a toolkit and you've got to choose the right tool to take out to solve the problem or, you know, so you wouldn't pick out the spanner if you want to bang a nail in. You've got to use the right tool and you don't have to use them all at once. You may just want to be working on one thing. So you use one tool, but hopefully through a session like this, you'll be able to know which tool is a good one for you to use. So that's what I'll be talking about in the technology area. And for teaching strategies, uh, I really will be talking about teenagers and a few things to do with pop, but it certainly won't be the whole focus because I've talked a lot about that. Um, and people have seen my courses and things about it. But one thing I do want to talk about is harmonizing and the way oh. I use harmonizing and transposing uh, right from the beginning with students and how even beginners learning very simple Mary Had a Little Lamb can learn the basic concepts of harmonizing and how important, in my opinion, that is for pianists. Oh, fantastic. Exactly. 
And that, that keys in so well with doing improvisation when you go, okay, so tr- now play that in F major mm. or then we're playing in C major, they you know, change the keys. That's brilliant, Tim. Mm. Cool. So that's. I want to go in chords. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I might. I might let you have a sneak peek at some stage. I don't know how that's going to work. But anyway, so that's kind of the that's the overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, and and I think one of the one of the other things too, people will have seen if if you if you're interested in these workshops, by the way, and you're listening to this, if you're at your computer, you can head to timtopham.com/transform. The workshops are called Transform Your Teaching, uh, and they're in uh, Australia, in Melbourne, and Sydney next week, uh, as for when this uh-huh. podcast goes live. Um, Adelaide in October, Perth and Brisbane in November. So we're in all those areas and, uh, you know, do make sure you get, get a ticket. It's, um, we're certainly not doing it to make, make much money from it. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty reasonably priced, 50 or $60 at full price. Um, although you might just get in with an early bird depending on when this podcast goes live. I should have, should have checked that. Um, but, you know, you, you're going to be having a practical day, a fun day, um, and you're going to be walking away with lots of ideas, but hopefully not overwhelmed as well because we so don't want to do that. There's also the hot seat. Tell us about that. Yeah, so the hot seat's an idea I've got from um, some other live events I've seen. And, and what I want to do is give uh, a teacher the chance to come up the front and workshop some ideas with us that is just particular to those those teachers. So it's picture it like a masterclass, but... As a teacher, you're not coming up to perform. You're coming up just to have a chat. And so you might want to ask us specifically, you know, you've got, uh, you've just started teaching groups and you really want to know some activities that you can use. Um, maybe you've got a, a teenage boy who's not really talking to you anymore and needs some new repertoire ideas. So we'll get stuck into that for you. Maybe you've got um, some business questions that you'd like to ask, you know. By being up the front, we'll have a discussion, but because it's a masterclass in in effect, everyone in the room will be able to learn from the discussions we're having and the things that we're doing. So that's the concept of the hot seat. Um, And you'll find out once you've uh, registered, you'll get an email from us with information about how you can um, apply, put your name down to uh, be in the hot seat if it interests you. Wow, that sounds fantastic. Because a lot lot of people often have lots of uh, of they don't realize that they have an idea, but then they hear someone go, oh, I've got this problem. They go, oh, actually, yeah, I've got that problem. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. That's something I could, I could really help do with some help with. Yeah. And look, I'd love for, for a teacher to come up and go, you know what, guys, I don't reckon that way that you showed us is actually very good. How about you have a look at what I do? You know, I'm, I'm very much open Absolutely. to the fact that we can all learn from each other. So, you know, let's, let's share all our ideas in these events. Absolutely. Yeah, we're certainly, as I said, you know, um, I always, I'm, none of the ideas I have are my own. I just plagiarise from everyone. Well, you know, we all we all do that. That's what you know. I it's probably why I haven't chosen to be a, um, you know, a Suzuki teacher or a simply music teacher. But I love the theories and ideas in those approaches. Uh, and I like kind of taking them and using bits and pieces in my own to create my own things. I think that's a great way to do it. Absolutely. Mm. So tell us, what um, professional development have you done um, in the last six to 12 months related to music? Well, And you've actually, no, I'm going to rephrase that question because I know you almost go every weekend and do something. In fact, you're off straight after this to <laughs> another lecture. So tell us about a a, a recent one uh, professional development or a lecture you went to that was that really made an impact on you? Uh, well, two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, I went to the or- New South Wales New South Wales Orf Association's workshop with Richard Gill and mm. had five hours with my hero, Richard Gill, um, and it was just fantastic. Um, you, better, and- you better tell the international audience who Richard Gill is if they haven't heard. He is uh, an, an international composer and conductor. He conducts opera um, and he's very involved in Australia at the moment in uh, a mentor in getting music education back into schools because funding is drying up as it is everywhere um, in the arts. And he has created a mentoring program in schools in, in New South Wales in Australia at the moment, which is working brilliantly and it's really 
fantastic. And he's really do. I mean, he's in his seventies, mm. um, and he's just he's just amazing. Um, and I was lucky enough, you know, stupidly because I know him. He goes. He, there was a, a bit where he wanted to do some improv- improvisation on a piano and because most of the people there were school teachers, like school music teachers, so often they don't play piano. And he went, Paul oh, Mike, you can come play that. I'm like, oh, no, don't make this. <laughs> <laughs> we were improvising in a 20th century style. I went, oh, just, just go for go it. Go with it. And had an absolute ball, but I learned so much. We started singing... We, the day started with singing 13th century chant and okay. we finished with singing um, a Stravinsky uh, work which was almost the same as the 13th century chant. It was quite huh. amazing. And we, and it, we covered all of, the un, all of the harmony that happened from the 13th century to the 20th century. It was just amazing. And understanding what ha- was happening with the harmony and then from a school teaching perspective how to teach that mm. um and so all of the stuff you would have loved it because you're talking about harmony and improvisation. yeah yeah and uh, sorry and transposition and that's exactly what he was talking about in the, in this workshop it was truly an amazing experience wow that's brilliant yeah sounds sounds good i i still uh, to be honest, haven't heard him speak live, and everyone oh, really? everyone talks so much about him. And I, I missed a recent opportunity when he was in Melbourne, but I yeah, I, I'm I'm hanging out to hear Richard Gill. So tell me, what was your latest? My very latest was a conference called Education Change Makers, uh, and this was this is a group uh, of people who go around the world trying to get together the people that want to change education, and. This is predominantly classroom uh, educators. So there was 350 people we met in Melbourne, uh, and it was it was a it was a very very cool conference. It was very it had a really kind of young hip vibe to it. You could text, and the coffee would arrive over here, and amazing oh. food, and it, it was it was a real pump up kind of event. And we had these speakers who were, um, you know, there was there was this amazing early 20 year old woman from Africa who has come from poverty and no education in her family to running and building her own school. Incredible stories of change. And we had students come in and talk about things that they were doing in their their classrooms. It was it was a really great event. I really did enjoy it. Um, so that was the most the most recent one. And I think the other the well, other ones I've done have been workshops and conferences where I've been presenting at them. Um, and one thing I do like to do when I um, speak at events is actually stay around for the whole event. And I know some speakers come in and they fly in and they do their thing and they leave. And I think it's such a waste because there's so much that I still want to learn from other people. So uh, I was in Brisbane at um, some workshops up there. Um, there was the music tech conferences and the MTMA, MTNA in Texas, which was great fun too. So, yeah, a fair bit fair bit went on this year. I learned a heap in the process. Oh, great. And, you know, Tim... I stumbled upon your um, podcasts oh, probably at least a year and a half ago now when I think you were under 10. Yeah, yeah. It's about <laughs> 18 like months. Going, sorry? It's about 18 months. Yeah, yeah. and it was like, um, wow, this is fantastic. I, you know, somebody's actually doing, because I'd actually thought about doing this myself because I think I love learning stuff and I love meeting people and, and learning more more things and you do learn so much from doing this sort of thing mm. and especially doing workshops I learn often as much as the participants totally um, from them. Um, so but like why are you doing it because <laughs> I love it but you know so tell us why are you actually doing it and you know what what what's your end game with it I, it wasn't it certainly was never my original intention to start to become a teacher of, of teachers and to become someone who can inspire other teachers to change what they do. But it has become a, a, an absolute driving passion in the last two to three years and particularly as things have grown and the podcast has become more recognised and the blog has as well. And, and I, I just I have this strong drive to change the nature of piano teaching around the world. That's what I want to do because there 
is still so many students who come through piano teaching in particular, but probably all instrumental teaching with very little to show for it and very little passion for it at the end. And even students who go through and do all these exams up to very high levels and then they, they quit. It's just, it's just an utter shame. And I want to make a change um, in that outcome for, for students. And the best way to do that for me, while I could do that to my own, however many students I can teach, if I can teach hundreds of teachers to do different things, then hopefully I can impact on thousands or tens of thousands of students. And that's, my, that's what drives me. That's fantastic. That's absolutely, absolutely a great reason to be doing it. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully it's making an impact. I do get some good feedback, so I know that uh, there is change going on. Uh, and I, I would just love people who are listening to this podcast and any of these podcasts, if you're enjoying it, then please share it with other teachers so that we can get other teachers doing the same thing. That, that is why I put all the effort in that I do. <laughs> as crazy as it is now we based hey, you know, um the talking about arts education um i went and saw uh J- um julie andrews yeah, wow. at the opera house she in an interview with her because she's directing the australian operas my fair lady um which is the 60th anniversary of the production that she was in 60 years ago wow Didn't so she's in her 80s mm. And she has just done a television show for Netflix on arts education and the importance of arts education. And she's done it with her daughter. And one of the things that she says is, are we lucky or what? And, you know, I I sometimes think to myself, you know, we're really lucky to, you know, to be able to have this sort of stuff. But I I was thinking about it and um, I think it's, it's just really important that we are actually doing and promoting arts education and teaching in the best possible way we can. Mm. You know, uh, I see a lot of often because I teach a lot of primary age kids, I often get a lot of kids who have been learning at school um, with headphones on and just doing a a two minute or, you know, they're having a 30 minute lesson, but there's six of them having a 30 minute lesson all on headphones. And so the teacher goes around to each one. So they effectively get a five minute lesson. Mm. I think so that's not education. That's not what, what music teaching is about. Mm. So why I'm passionate about music education as well is also about that whole arts education, um, that it improves our community. Mm. Absolutely. And arts, the arts are so important and that, wouldn't it be great if those people could be involved in the arts in some way? And it builds audience for professional musicians as well. And you know, th- th- we don't even need to talk about the research. I think most people would know about the positive effects that music has, all that kind of stuff. We all agree we're all musicians anyway. Uh, but if there's one thing that we can do to show that we're serious is be, one, professional, two, be the best we can be, and that means to continually develop ourselves and our teaching ability through professional Absolutely. development. Exactly. Yeah. Working in schools too. I, you know, I, I've worked in schools pretty much all my life and I know that education keeps changing. It keeps evolving and classroom teachers have to keep, have to keep uh, current and fresh and keep doing new things because the schools will, will latch on to a new idea that they think is the way to move forward and they'll go right all teachers need to now do this and it's like well uh okay let's let's go this is what we're doing Uh, some would obviously get very frustrated by that but good teachers will go right let's let's try this out unfortunately of course in independent music education that doesn't happen and that's when we can end up in our little silo doing our own thing that may be working but could be better Exactly. And this is the opportunity. This, I mean, this is why we're doing these workshops so that people have the opportunity and they're reasonably low cost. Um, people can uh, come along um, and, um, and be part of it and, then, and also make new friends and socialise. Yeah. Yeah. That, which I just think that's one of the great things. I love going to the workshops and meet new people. Yeah, let's face it. That's you know another half of the whole equation of a live conference or workshop, isn't it? It's meeting people, hanging out with physical people, all the online stuff is great. I'm obviously passionate about it, but nothing quite beats hanging out and having a coffee with someone. Exactly. Yeah, cool. Well, look, I think we, we should probably start wrapping it up. Um, 
So for people who are interested in the events, I'll quickly run through the dates. Melbourne is 21st of September and Sydney the 25th of September. This is 2016, both in school holiday time. Um, Adelaide is... So, that's a, so Melbourne is a Wednesday, isn't it? It is a Wednesday, yes. And, and Sydney's a Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Yes. And I think all the others are Sundays. So Adelaide's the 2nd of October. Perth is the 6th of November and Brisbane the 20th of November, all around about 10 till 3 or thereabouts. Um, and you can get grab tickets and find out more, read about what's actually happening, timtopham.com slash transform. So is there anything else you wanted to cover quickly before we uh, wrap it up, Paul? Not that I can think of, Tim. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been good. I think before we started talking about this, we said, look, we could probably chat for about three hours on these kind of topics, but I think we've done pretty well. We're right on 50 minutes. Exactly. So, look, thanks so much for joining me today and thanks so much for uh, working with me on these live events. It's going to be so much fun. I actually can't wait to do it. It's going to be great. Yeah, me too. I'm really looking forward to it. Brilliant. All right. Well, I'll see you very soon. And um, if you've got any questions, guys, about any of the events or what we're doing, just head to the show notes page for this episode, which will be timtopham.com slash episode 58. And we'll pop some links there to any of the things we've talked about. And you mentioned a video that you've got too, so we'll chuck that on the page too. No problem. Great. Thanks so much, Paul. We'll speak to you again soon. Cheers, Tim. See ya. If the idea of a piano teacher's community where you get to access the best educational resources, rub shoulders with expert teachers from around the world and have immediate access to feedback for any of your questions, then Inner Circle membership is for you. The Inner Circle is my private community of piano teachers from across the globe who share a commitment to creating and delivering the most inspiring, modern and progressive learning experiences for their students. Membership is now open, so head to timtopham.com forward slash community to find out more and get involved today. I can't wait to see you on the inside.